Campus unrest was common across America in the late 60s, as was the emergence of the Black Power Movement. Protests, sit-ins, violence, and bombings rocked the country during this time, even in Appalachia. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and you're listening to Stories, a history of Appalachia. You know, Steve, I didn't know about this going on at this college, but of course, this is in West Virginia. Bluefield State College is where this took place at. But, you know, I know there were a lot of things going on at the time, especially during the late 60s, but this kind of surprised me. You know, Bluefield is probably about 100 miles as the crow flies from where you and I both lived about that Mm -hmm. time. I do not remember anything about this on the news, although, you know, I was like 11 years old, so I probably didn't pay much attention to it. But you'd think you'd have heard something about this. Yeah. And what are we talking about, you might say? Well, it happens to do with a black college in Bluefield, West Virginia. You see, back in the days of Jim Crow, segregated institutions of higher learning sprang up all over the South. Now, these schools were designed to keep black and white students separated, with African-American students usually relegated to the inferior schools. But despite this, many of these historically black colleges achieved high academic standards through sheer hard work and determination. And one of these colleges was located right in the heart of coal country in Bluefield, West Virginia. Opened as the Bluefield Colored Institute, the college was founded in 1895 on a four-acre site within 100 miles of 70% of West Virginia's African-American population at the time. By the 1920s, the Institute had become known as the Teachers College, preparing educators throughout the coal fields. Soon the school, now known as Bluefield State Teachers College, was at the center of black culture in Appalachia, becoming involved in the Harlem Renaissance cultural explosion. Among those celebrities who came to Bluefield were poet Langston Hughes, boxer Joe Lewis, Fats Waller, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, and Count Basie, among others. In 1947, Bluefield State College, as it was now named, was awarded full academic accreditation, and by the fall of 1954, the school became integrated, along with all the other state-supported colleges in West Virginia. By the 1960s, Bluefield College had expanded beyond being strictly a teacher's college, offering arts and sciences degrees, as well as engineering technology. Things were going well for the college. But, Rod, there was a problem brewing. For, you see, after World War II, there was a growing exodus of African Americans from the coal fields, making southern West Virginia more and more white. By the mid-60s, the state had installed the first white president of the college, and more and more of the staff and faculty, traditionally black, were being replaced with white staff and faculty. The number of white students were increasing as well, And this change in the nature of the college led to conflict. Well, by the late 1960s, black students who mainly lived in the dorms on campus were protesting what they felt was a state-led effort to transform Bluefield State College from a traditional black college into a white commuter college. They maintained that the white personnel that had been hired were less qualified than the black ones they had replaced. There were marches confrontations between students and the administration, much like on other campuses throughout the country at the time. All of this protest and racial tension eventually led to the unthinkable. Over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, when most of the personnel and students were home on break, an explosion tore a huge hole in the wall of the school gymnasium on November 21, 1968. Now, nobody was injured in the blast, although there were newspaper accounts of damage caused to faculty houses. The explosion did, however, trigger an immediate response from the administration and from the state of West Virginia. Local police also received reports of bombs placed at the college swimming pool and at the administration building, but nothing was found. There were also reports from administration officials of black power death threats against them. That fall had also seen windows broken, bricks thrown, and tires slashed. A $5,000 reward was offered by West Virginia Governor Hewlett C. Smith for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the people responsible for the explosion, and President Wendell Hardaway responded by immediately shutting down the school dormitories, 
which had the effect of penalizing almost the entire black student body since they were the ones who mainly used the dorms. According to Hardaway, the dorms had to be closed because the school couldn't guarantee their safety at night under the present state of unrest on the campus and would be closed indefinitely. Hardaway blamed the bombing on, quote, northern agitators. By November 25th, authorities had arrested a student in connection with the bombing, 26-year-old Edgar James, charging him under a 50-year-old law designed to thwart Coalfield Union organizing violence called the Red Man Act with conspiracy to inflict damage or injury and a possession of explosives with criminal intent. The Associated Press described James as a militant Negro student leader who had issued a list of 35 grievances to President Hardaway demanding his removal as president of Bluefield State College and the replacement of other college school administrators. Soon other black students were arrested. By the 28th, there were five men in custody, including Edgar James. The others were Nathaniel Johnson, 21, of McDowell County, William C. Travis of Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, Shannon Banks of Bluefield, and Paul Crockett of Kingsport, Tennessee, who was arrested at his home in Kingsport and transported back to the Mercer County Jail. They were charged with the same charges as James. Then in February, a year-old State Human Rights Commission report was made public. Now, this report, Rod, which had been kept under wraps previously, alleged discrimination on campus, you know, in everything from faculty salaries to inequitable financing, inadequate physical plant, and insufficient faculty to a limited curriculum. According to the report, the major impact of this unfairness had fallen upon Negro students and their supervisors. Well, not surprisingly, the West Virginia Board of Education rejected the report and its allegation of racial discrimination at Bluefield State College. Well, by March, one of the arrested men had been tried and convicted. William Travis was sentenced to a minimum of five years in the state penitentiary. Travis appealed his conviction and was released on a $25,000 bond. Edgar James was eventually released, as were the others. And the effect of the bombing? Well, with the closing of the dorms, black students living there had to find housing in the Bluefield area, if they could find any. Less and less African Americans applied to Bluefield State College, resulting in a student body that was at one time less than 6% black. Bluefield State, though, is still considered a historically black college and, as such, is eligible for aid from the federal government, even though it's the whitest historically black college in the country all because of a bomb at the gym. And, you know, we were talking before the podcast. At, at one time, I believe you did some play-by-play for uh, University of Virginia at Wise, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you were talking about when Bluefield State would come down to play UVA Wise, that it was very odd that they were considered a historically black college because most of the players were white. Right, and they did have some black players on the team, but mostly a lot of white players were playing at that time. And it always surprised me because I was always under the impression, like you said, Bluefield State was a historically black college. Yeah, and as far as this bombing that happened up there, I've not been able to find where they were able to discover who did the bombing Mm -hmm. and why the bombing happened when it did. There were some reports of bombs that had been located in black neighborhoods up in that area afterwards. So there was quite a bit of tension going on up there. None of those bombs ever went off. It was just the discovery of that. And also, you know, bomb threats and things along those lines. So the bombing, still a mystery to this day. Yeah, and when we talk about these historically black colleges, Bluefield State falls into the category of such colleges as Tuskegee, mm-hmm. Morehouse, Grambling, some of those colleges that we have known and Sometimes we see them on television. I know when they have the Bayou Classic, a lot of people look at that and they say Grambling University or whoever it might be that they're playing against. You know, that's the historically black colleges that are in this country. That's just some of them as as opposed to what is out there. There's a large number of them out there. Absolutely. And that's the story of the bombing at Bluefield State College. Another story that makes up the history of this place we call home. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to have our stories come to you automatically, well, simply subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. 
For more stories about Appalachia, you can follow us on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia or on Twitter at Story Appalachia. We do appreciate this opportunity for Rod and me to share a bit of the history of Appalachia with you. Till next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. Mm-hmm.